kilometers from Srinagar, you will come across Burza home, which could well be described as the Stonehenge of India. A contemporary of England's most famous prehistoric site, Burza home tells stories of old settlers, trade networks, and perhaps even great astronomical events. It's a cold autumn morning and the local boys are busy playing a game of cricket. This field, covering ancient treasures going back more than 7,000 years, made headlines last year when archaeologists, historians and we at Live History India raised our voice against the negligence of this critical site. Unimaginable as it may sound, this was used for local IPL-style cricket league tournaments. While you can still find a hint of the games here, things are back to normal. But most people are still oblivious to the wonders of the site. Tourists never come here. So why is Burza home so significant and what secrets does it hold? Burza home, why Burza home is important is there are a lot of reasons for that. Because it becomes one of the important sites on the fringe in the Himalayas, particularly, which connects Central and South Asia. So in between this mountainous region, you have this uh, very unique site, which was excavated in 1960s. Prior to that, 1935, S.D. Tarantiti Patterson, who conducted, you know, a Yale Cambridge expedition in uh, Kashmir and other regions around in 1935 around. So they also saw this uh, saw site as one of the important sites that connects two different cultural you know, uh, domains of Central and South Asia. That's why when excavated start, excavation started at the site, it was because of that the excavation that many things got exposed. That you, know, you have a huge skeletal remains from that site. It was unprecedented because nowhere in, uh, in 1960s, prior to 1960s, nowhere in India, including whole of South Asia, such a huge skeletal uh, you know, uh, remains were found. So second important thing which was very unique was the material culture from the particular uh, you know, site, which is to some extent very close to the Central Asia, even has a little bit Chinese affiliations. Uh, even some people uh, you know, see it very close to the Far East uh, regions. And some say, it, you know, it has directly come from Central Asia via the Levant region in West Asia and all that. So there are a lot of comparisons people have made. So because of that, it got very, you know, unique status within the Himalayan region. And uh, to be frank, that there was no other site in the Himalayan region uh, prior to the excavation of Burzum, which was, you know, known very, you know, very well known, basically. That's why uh, to connect Central and South Asia, uh, Himalayas played a very important role. And coming up from Himalayas, such a site like Burzohom, with huge material diversity, which connects both the regions, it became very important for many people. At the museum run by the University of Kashmir, you can find the details of what was found in Burzohom. Skeletons of a man, a child and animals. But what made this site really stand out in the early years after it was discovered in 1936 was the underground chambers or pits that many archaeologists believed were dwellings, quite like the igloos of the Eskimos. In 1936, an expedition led by Helmut de Terra and Dr. Thompson Patterson from the universities of Yale and Cambridge excavated the site and discovered the cultural remains which covered three different archaeological periods. People lived in Burza home for millennia and they left behind a range of everyday things that give us insights into their lives. During excavations, you know, what happened in uh, 1960s, the excavation lasted for about 10 years. And there was a diverse opinion from the scholars who excavated, like Ian Pazanti and many others who excavated. You know, they come up with this theory that people were living at Bozahong in pits, like devilling pits, which was a quite, you know, 
of uh, sort of a phenomena in archaeological studies, you know, throughout South Asia, quite a number of places people have talked about, you know, devilling pits. People were living in, in those pits for a long period of time. Uh, but uh, recently what happened that we have found a number of sites in Kashmir Valley where those pits are visible. And uh, then in many, uh, you know, uh, excavations, uh, which quite recently from last couple of years happened in, you know, many other regions in South Asia, like in Pakistan and many other regions. So what happened that uh, these uh, devilling pits were, you know, uh, to some extent, you know, the theory of devilling pits was, you know, uh, uh, put away by the people and talked about that these pits were actually granaries to store the, you know, uh, particular uh, whatever produce they had agricultural produce or whatever. So in our recent studies in Kashmir, particularly in Kasimbag and many other sites, uh, like Petkurantang, there is another site, Gandharbal region. We saw these pits in the stratification and we tried to analyze it on the basis of the evidence we have from Burzuhum. And we were quite sure that these pits from new sites now produce a lot of material, which is actually archaeobotanical in nature, and huge amount of, you know, seeds, grains were recovered from these pits. And from Burzom, it was also reported that these pits had some, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, archaeobotanical material uh, that time. And then, you know, despite that, people called these pits as deviling pits. People were, so they translated these as deviling pits, that people were living in those pits. But that was not the case. Uh, particularly, the recent research has suggested otherwise, as I said already, that these pits were, uh, you know, considered devilling pits now. Uh, earlier, now we translate them to as, you know, storage pits. So basically, to our understanding that uh, there were, there are, uh, you know, number of post holes were also recovered during excavations. You know, there were uh, incidents where people, you know, the people who excavated the site, they reported the post holes. That means that there was some structure above ground, you know, uh, where people must have been, you know, living. And since the structure might have been only, uh, you know, of wooden nature, so wood perishes quite often in archaeological context. You do not find wood uh, continuing. And um, the climate of Kashmir is also like that, that it cannot, the wood cannot sustain for quite a period of a long time. So, because of that, also the things are very, very, you know, uh, difficult to understand. In fact, uh, whether these pits could be considered, you know, dwellings or not. The famous dwelling pits that made Burza home so famous came from period one of the site. It is the oldest and most significant part for many reasons. It is from this period that we see evidence of these subterranean chambers, crude pottery and fishbone tools. The period saw burials with everyday material, grave goods like decorative beads, food grain and lentils. We see major changes in the settlement pattern in period 2. Post holes have been found on the site indicating the foundations of mud brick houses above the ground. Human burials became even more prominent in this period, indicating an expansion of the settlement. The dead were usually buried under house floors or in compounds. No grave goods were found in these burials. But burials of domesticated animals along with humans have been found. The use of megaliths is a core feature of the megalithic period. The massive stone slabs resembling the ones in Stonehenge seem to have had some ritual or astronomical significance, but no concrete evidence of this has been found. Another artifact from Burza home has created quite a stir far beyond the realm of history and archaeology. This etching, originally on a stone slab found at the site, bears a scene depicting two human figures and a dog hunting a stag. What is curious about the hunting scene, however, are the two concentric circles with 16 radiating lines all around. The depiction of two suns on the horizon has led some astronomy experts to speculate that this could represent the occurrence of a supernova incident. Astrophysicist M. N. Vahia 
Hrishikesh Jogelkar and Ankit Sule of Mumbai's Tata Institute of Fundamental Research or TIFR mapped the nearest visible supernova to 4600 BC within the time period of these settlers. The celestial phenomenon was enormous at its peak. The supernova remnant HB9 is said to have glowed as bright as the moon. What happened uh, at Burzaum, there was a, you know, during excavations, uh, a small rock was, you know, a stone slab or sort of a thing was recovered. And on that, there was a hunting scene uh, where, uh, you know, people were, uh, you know, in a hunting posture and there was a dog even there. And then uh, near to the uh, whole scene, there were two suns were shown on that. So many people have different translations about that. Some people say that this is a depiction of the earliest supernova because of the two suns on the uh, stone slab. And some people say that this is a daily routine of the people at the site and they have depicted it on, uh, you know, uh, stone. And some people have even related this particular to some other astronomical phenomena, you know, uh, having two suns that was recorded some 5,000 years back. And there is a lot of some sort of a research by Tata uh, Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, there is Professor Wahia is there. And he has, uh, to some extent, uh, concluded that this particular stone slip has uh, the earliest recorded supernova uh, depictions on that. And that's why it becomes, again, very important. The site becomes important because you don't have any sort of evidence in South Asia uh, like that uh, from any Neolithic site or even Harappan site or somewhere else. So uh, this becomes, again, a very important phenomenon to look at the site very differently. And it becomes very significant even, you know, to relate it to the earliest astronomical, you know. And then there are, other things related to the astronomy at Burzum, you know, people have translated megaliths, which are uh, which are thought to have, you know, in the shape of the uh, what do you call it, Stonehenge. So that has again some astronomical, you know, value for the people who are, uh, you know, basically from physics and many other uh, astronomical, you know, related disciplines. Interestingly, excavations over the last few decades have shown that Burza Home was not just an isolated Neolithic site. A network of as many as 40 sites have been found across Kashmir and they indicate strong linkages with Central Asia. The material evidence dating back to the early historic periods also shows the continuity of this cultural exchange well into the medieval and even early modern times. During the Chalcolithic phase, there is also a strong connection indicated between people living here and the Harappan world. Archaeologists believe that these sites indicate how Kashmir played an important role connecting Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent from the earliest times. There is Burzaham, there is Gufkral, there is Kanispur in Baramula, and there are many other sites, almost two to three dozen sites have been reported from archaeological ex excavation and exploration so far. This uh, Kanispur emerged as a Neolithic site as well, though it has been uh, known as a very, uh, uh, very much for the early historic site of the Kushan period, but it has cultural deposits which date back to the Neolithic period as well. So overall, all these you know, sites has a, a Neolithic, and to some extent, some sites have uh, early historic material, Koshan material also. We had Gufkral again, which gave clear evidence of the megalithic period, as well as some very interesting finds from the, uh, for the uh, uh, iron to be introduced in the Himalayan region, the earliest dates of iron from Kashmir Valley. Kashmir is breathtakingly beautiful. And looking at the valley of Srinagar, it's hard to imagine that all this formed the base of a lake till not so long ago. Around 12,000 years ago, the waters of the lake began to drain, leaving the fertile bed or floor easily accessible and habitable for human settlers. This site of Burzahom may have been one of the many places where a settlement grew and thrived. The earliest evidence of agriculture here, for instance, comes from 3000 BCE. Mountain chains have often integrated people rather than isolated them. You know, this is a phenomenon which has, you know, which was there, very well there in 
the you know earliest human societies earliest human cultures so people were always curious about what lies around them what lies you know about the mountains what what lies you know beyond the rivers and you know everything in the uh, uh, particular topography and all that so uh, considering this particular thing you know and putting into the context of kashmir valley and then how it plays how it played a very a sort of a bridge between central asia and south asia is very important to understand recent studies uh, have shown that you know migrations were happening from very very beginning you know as i said earlier that ladakh was a region where the earliest evidence of uh, you know human uh, existence have been quite recently recorded uh, through archaeological studies. So these go back to more than 10,000 years. And, and then, you know, uh, these evidence are, of course, of the highland settlements. Ladakh obviously was not was uh, a, a harsh region. It's still a, a harsh region to live in for the human beings. But in prehistory, the region was very much, you know, uh, harsh and the climatic conditions were too, you know, uh, uh, difficult to, uh, for the people, for the animals to survive. But in that particular times, in those times also, uh, you know, this particular region of the uh, Ladakh region particularly had the evidence of the human beings which were, you know, traversing this whole region. So we have uh, evidence from Ladakh, we have evidence from Zanskar, we have evidence now in Kashmir. So all these evidence combined, you know, uh, when we see the com com comparative, uh, you know, analysis of all these evidence, it's it's it has shown that the people were continuous continuously in touch with them, uh, one another, you know, throughout the Neolithic period. They were in touch with one another during the early historic period, and the connections grew more and more in that. Uh, 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 throughout the historical period uh, as well. So then the trade was introduced and many other things were introduced. But the earliest form of the connections are still to some extent unknown. But we can bridge a gap by uh, you know, considering Kashmir and by considering Burzohom in a, a sort of a bridge between uh, the cultures of Central and South Asia. And it played that role for a very long period of, period of time. While we look at mountains as a divide, sites in Kashmir show that mountain chains have always integrated and brought people together, rather than isolated them. However, the information around Burzahom and the sites across Kashmir remains scanty, and this is sad because they could tell us so much more.